fifteen of the Outline of Science, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson, Chapter Twenty Two: The Chemist as Creator. Modern chemistry practically dates from the time when the burning fire became intelligible, when the great French savant, Lavoisier, made it clear that a burning substance unites with oxygen from the air and gives off an acid, carbonic acid gas. He proved with his fine balance that the increase in the weight of the substance burned corresponded to the loss in weight in the surrounding air. This does not sound very exciting nowadays, but it was epoch-making, for Lavoisier realized that in all chemical operations it is only the kind of matter that is changed, the quantity remaining the same. THE CONSERVATION OF MATTER This was the discovery of the conservation of matter, one of the foundation stones of chemistry, and not only a foundation stone, but a touchstone of accuracy, for it was henceforth certain that in every chemical operation the accounts must balance. The total mass of the substances taking part in any chemical operation remains constant, no matter what kaleidoscopic transformations may be effected. Since the masses of bodies are at any one place exactly proportional to their weights, the fundamental idea may read that in any series of chemical operations the weight at the end must equal the weight at the beginning. When Lavoisier made one of his famous experiments of passing water vapor over red-hot iron turnings and collecting the hydrogen which was thus produced from the water, he weighed everything, the water to begin with, the iron turnings before and after, and the hydrogen gas as the issue, and his accounts balanced. Nowadays we are so sure that the accounts must balance, that if they do not, then we must discredit the experiment. The solid ice becomes running water, which is caught up into the air as mist, which may become rain on the cold surface of the mountains. But in all the protean changes there is neither creation nor destruction." We can neither create nor destroy the smallest particle. The elements which enter into the composition of the soap bubble film are as lasting as those which form the granite rocks. Nothing can go lost. That is certain. At the entrance of a great exhibition there is usually a change office, which is the seat of busy operations throughout the day. Sometimes a visitor comes with a one-pound note, which is not acceptable at the turnstile, and asks for small money. Sometimes a tramway conductor comes with a hundred and twenty pennies, and begs for something lighter, and there are all sorts of operations. But if the change office is fortunate enough to have perfectly accurate operators, it will not make anything or lose anything all the live-long day. The form of the money is continually changing, but the amount of money remains always the same. So it must be in all chemical operations. There cannot be anything massive or quantitative in the end which was not there in the beginning nor anything in the beginning which has not its precise quantitative counterpart in the end. How, then, can we think of the chemist as creative? Constancy in the properties of elements. But we must go a step further. There is a remarkable stability in the properties of things. There are chemical elements in unthinkably distant stars, so the spectroscope tells us, which are the same as those on our own earth. Moreover, as the spectroscope continues to tell us, the properties of these elements remain the same, whether here or there. A molecule of hydrogen in the dog star Sirius seems to behave just like a molecule of hydrogen in a London laboratory. The furniture of the earth and the heavens may change from style to style, but the fundamental properties of its constituents remain. This conclusion requires careful handling, in view of the disintegration of the atom in radioactive substances. But on the whole, there remains validity in what Professor Clerk Maxwell said in his famous Discourse on Molecules, in 1873. Though in the course of ages catastrophes have occurred and may yet occur in the heavens, though ancient systems may be dissolved and new systems evolved out of their ruins, the molecules, a modern chemist would say atoms, out of which these systems are built, the foundation stones of the material universe remain unbroken and unworn. They continue this day as they were created, perfect in number and measure and weight. In the face of this, how can we speak of the chemist as creator? Making vital products artificially. The first reason for calling the chemist creative is to be found in the fact that he has been able to build up artificially 
what used to be regarded as exclusively vital productions. This is called chemical synthesis, and its development forms one of the most interesting chapters in the history of science. The beginning of the triumphant progress was in 1828, when Wohler discovered that the salt known as ammonium cyanate changes spontaneously, when its solution is evaporated, into urea. Why should that be important? The reason was this. Urea is a nitrogenous waste product formed by mammals, and filtered out of the body in the urine. Like other products of the living body, urea was regarded as a characteristic vital product. But cyanate of ammonia can be made apart from living creatures, and yet it readily changes into urea. This was the thin end of the wedge. The substances made by living creatures could no longer be kept on a platform by themselves. Wohler's experiment showed that one of them, at least, could arise apart from life altogether. And just about the same time, 1826-1828, to 1828, another pioneer, Henry Hennel, was able to build up alcohol from a simpler carbon compound, ethylene. What was regarded as the yeast plant's exclusive prerogative was attained along a different path without any living organism at all. It is true that neither of these important steps received due attention. Wohler and Hennel were before their time, but they had the illustrious list of synthetic chemists. Outdoing Nature Indigo, much used in dyeing and formerly obtained from the indigo plant, is now made artificially, and the same is true of turkey-red dye, which used to be obtained from the roots of the matter. Vanillin, much used in confectionery, was formerly obtained altogether from the vanilla plant, but it is now made in large quantities artificially. Oil of wintergreen, used in medicine, was formerly obtained from the plant pyrola, which grows in shady woods, but is now made artificially. The sepia, which painters used to employ for somber pictures, was obtained from the ink bag of sepia and other cuttlefishes, a bag of waste products which these big brain creatures eject into the water to cloak their retreat from their enemies. But if a modern painter uses sepia, it is an artificially built up pigment. It does not come from the cuttlefish. So we might continue through a long list. There has been an artificial synthesis of sugar, of caffeine, of salicylic acid, and scores of other complex substances. The list grows every year. The chemist outdoes nature. There are two points of great interest here. The first theoretical, the second practical. The interesting theoretical point is that the artificial production of a certain organic compound does not usually correspond to the natural production of the same substance. Thus, the artificial production may require great heat, which is out of the question in a plant or animal. We take a walk in a wood in spring and pull a few of the clover-like leaves of the wood sorrel, whose technical name is worth recording, Oxalis acetosella. We taste these beautiful leaves, almost as beautiful as the pendant, translucent white flower bells. We enjoy the pleasant oxalate taste, like the acid drops of our childhood, due to the salts formed in the course of the chemical routine of the wood sorrel's life. How these pleasant oxalate salts arose in the wood sorrel's leaves is not our question just now, except to this extent, that they certainly were not formed in the same way as the synthetic chemist, the magician of his craft, builds up oxalates in his laboratory. The second point is strictly practical. If living plants make indigo and living animals make sepia, why should man be so proud of an artificial imitation, which means an ousting of natural production? The answer is not always easy, but it is clear in cases where the chemist can manufacture large quantities of a valuable material without great expense. Thus he has been able to build up the potent substance called adrenaline, used in stopping bleeding and for other purposes, a substance which is produced only in very small quantities by the suprarenal capsules of animals. It is one of the important internal secretions or hormones which are discussed elsewhere. To obtain adequate supplies of adrenaline for medical purposes would mean killing a large number of animals. How much more economical when the synthetic chemist can build up this precious substance from simple constituents? In so doing, he is a creator. Coal Tar Colors The chemists have not been content to imitate nature. They have gone one better. They have made new things and fine illustrations of this may be found in the story of coal tar products. Everyone knows that when coal is used to make gas, there is a residue of useful coke and of coal tar. This strong-smelling, dark-colored coal tar used to be regarded as a troublesome by-product. 
It is now known to be a sort of treasure house of dyes and drugs, of perfumes and explosives. It has been called one of the most useful substances in the world. The reasonable question at once arises, why should coal tar be such a treasury, a magic purse of Fontanatis, as Dr. Slosson says? The answer is twofold. A. That coal tar is a mixture of organic substances which were built up in the ancient club moss and horsetail forests, the remains of which formed the coal deposits. And B. Because the chemist can juggle with the primary products so as to build up quite new artificial ones. When the coal tar obtained from the distillation of coal is redistilled, it yields materials like carbolic acid, phenol, so much used as a disinfectant, like naphthalene, used in driving moths away from furs, like benzene or benzol, and so on. The residue left after about ten colorless liquids or white solids have been separated off is the familiar black pitch. 1. The chemist unit is a molecule, the smallest amount of an element that can exist separately, and he is accustomed to picture the molecule as composed of atoms linked together by hands or bonds. Thus the molecule of hydrogen, H, may be pictured as H-H, -H, each atom having one hand. The atom of carbon is pictured as if it had four hands, and thus the symbol of the simplest hydrocarbon, marsh gas, is carbon attached to four hydrogens, or CH4. Now the coal tar product called benzene, B-E-N-Z-E-N-E, -E -E, note the previously mentioned benzene, B-E-N-Z-I-N-E, -E, is a different thing altogether, has the puzzling formula C6H6, puzzling because it is not easy to see how the four-handed atoms of carbon can be satisfied with six one-handed atoms of hydrogen. The puzzle was solved by the German chemist Kekulé, who saw that the symbol of the benzene molecule should be like a ring or hexagon, in which the carbon atoms are linked together by alternating single and double bonds, while the hydrogen atoms hold on to the outside hands. To explain the importance of this, we quote a paragraph from Dr. Edwin E. Slosson's Creative Chemistry, 1921, a brilliantly successful popular exposition of chemical synthesis. We need not suppose that the benzene molecule, if we could see it, would look anything like this diagram of it, but the theory works, and that is all the scientist asks of any theory. By its use, thousands of new compounds have been constructed, which have proved of inestimable value to man. The modern chemist is not a discoverer, he is an inventor. He sits down at his desk and draws a Kekulé ring, or rather hexagon. Then he rubs out a hydrogen and hooks a nitro group, NO2, onto the carbon in place of it, Next he rubs out the O2 of the nitro group and puts in H2. Then he hitches on such other elements, or carbon chains and rings, as he likes. He works like an architect designing a house, and when he gets a picture of the proposed compound to suit him, he goes into the laboratory to make it. Perhaps what he makes may bear the hyphenated name sodium ditalo disazo beta naphthalamine 6 sulfonic beta naphthalamine 3 6 disulfonate the commercial contraction of which is brilliant Congo dye. To sum up, the coal tar yields ten primary products or crudes, like benzene. These have yielded some three hundred intermediates, like aniline, and from these have been created literally thousands of dyes of all hues and shades. The history is very interesting, and it is briefly this. After some pioneer discoveries, a big step was taken by Hoffman, a student in Liebig's laboratory, who showed that brilliant colors could be obtained from certain coal tar products chemically related to an aniline oil, which had been obtained long ago by Zinin from natural indigo. Hoffman went to teach in the Royal College of Science in London, and he had as one of his students a boy of fifteen, William Henry Perkin. This genius was set to work to prepare artificial quinine, and in 1856 he discovered mauve, the first of the aniline dyes, and a new substance in the world. Ten years later he discovered how to produce artificially the coloring matter called turkey red or alizarin, which had previously been obtained from the root of the matter plant. At one time half a million tons of matter were raised annually in France, but after Perkins' discovery, as Professor Slosson puts it, the matter fields of France were put to other uses, and even the French soldiers became dependent on made-in-Germany dyes for their red trousers. The British soldiers were placed in a similar situation, as regards their red coats, when after 1878 
the azo scarlets, put the cochineal bug out of business. For it was from the body of the female cochineal insect, Cocos cacti, a native of Mexico to start with, that the scarlet coloring matter was obtained. We must not linger over the story of the coal tar colors. There are so many other creations to be discussed. What happened in regard to turkey red happened in regard to indigo, which came originally from an Indian plant related to the British woad, in regard to Tyrian purple, which came originally from a Mediterranean sea snail, murex, and in so many other cases. It is a matter for regret that when Hoffman returned to Germany, he practically took the young industry with him, an instance of British lack of imagination and foresight. By 1914 the Germans were manufacturing more than three-fourths of all the coal tar products of the world, and supplying material for most of the rest. It must be understood that the coal tar dyes are often good for much more than dyeing the robes of cardinals, the uniforms of soldiers, the socialites' necktie, and even ladies' ribbons. Thus, to mention only one, the dye called flavine is a quick killer of the microbes of abscesses. An ally to the coal tar dyes are many coal tar drugs, many of them not unmixed blessings, like aspirin, phenacetin, sulfonal, and veronal. Artificial Perfumes Nothing derogatory is implied in the term artificial, for why should indigo built up by the devices of the rational chemist be necessarily inferior to that elaborated in the indigo plant, or why should the musk made from a coal tar product be necessarily inferior to that secreted by the musk deer? That the artificially produced substance is not made in the same way as the naturally produced substance is certain, but chemically they are the same when they are finished. It is possible that minute impurities or accessories cling about the natural product, which give it a charm of individuality, like that distinguishing a woodcut from a zinc block, or a wrought iron gate from one of cast iron. In any case, the main fact in regard to perfumes, as in regard to more important products, is that man first sought laboriously for the natural. He then tried to adapt nature to his purposes, for example, by growing acres of scented flowers, and third, he has gone on another tack altogether, that of creating for himself. Thus the chief ingredient of attar or oil of roses is geraniol, which can be made synthetically, and the fragrance of orange flowers has been successfully captured by the artificial building up of neroli. What is true of perfumes holds also for flavors, appealing to the other chemical sense taste, the twin sister of smell. Thus vanillin, artificially synthesized in 1874, is extensively used, instead of the identical vanillin from vanilla beans. Our only protest is this. Let the natural and the artificial products compete fairly. Let the aesthetes decide how far they are physiologically and psychologically equivalent. Let us pay accordingly, if we please. But do not mix synthetic geraniol with attar of roses. Synthetic Rubber India rubber, or caoutchouc, is a gum which occurs in the milky juice of many plants, and abundantly in a few, especially in certain trees of the spurge and the fig orders. The milk flows out when the tree is cut, and rubber trees are now cultivated in many places where they are not native. The material is used, as everyone knows, for tires, waterproofs, galoshes, hot water bottles, syringes, stoppers, and in hardened form as vulcanite. It has almost been forgotten that the name rubber referred to its early use as an eraser. Another gum, known as gutta percha, is used for isolating submarine cables and for making golf balls. When rubber is heated in a retort, it splits up into a benzene, B-E-N-Z-I-N-E, -E, like liquid, called isoprene, and the synthetic chemist problem was first to make this isoprene artificially, and second, to change it into caoutchouc. The whole story is an extraordinary one, but we can only say that isoprene can be made artificially in various ways, for example, from the fusel oil yielded by fermenting potato starch, and that isoprene can be changed into caoutchouc in various ways, for example, by drying it over metallic sodium. In 1912 there were exhibited in New York two automobile tires of artificial rubber which had run a thousand miles. But while the problem has been solved scientifically, it has not been solved industrially, for it does not pay to get isoprene from potatoes or from turpentine. 
the most promising method is perhaps to heat coal and lime in an electric furnace. They unite to form calcium carbide, which in contact with water yields acetylene, and from this gas it is possible to make isoprene and therefore rubber. Yet it remains more profitable to go to the rubber tree. Sugar Making For many ages men knew of sweetness only from fruits and honey, but in the course of time they learned to press the sugar cane. How this sweet reed was carried from the Far East to the West Indies is an interesting story, but it does not concern us here, nor how Napoleon was instrumental in rivaling the sugar cane with the beetroot, which is rich in precisely the same sucrose. Of formula, carbon-12, hydrogen-22, oxygen-11. Of course, all green plants make sugar, but only the cane and the beet, we need hardly count the maple, do so in sufficient abundance to be worth tapping, except through bees or as concerns their fruit. What the chemist has done in regard to sugar is to distinguish its different natural kinds, to make some new ones on his own, and to make it possible to get this valuable nutrient very pure. As Dr. Slosson says, common sugar is almost an ideal food, cheap, clean, white, portable, imperishable, unadulterated, pleasant-tasting, germ-free, highly nutritious, completely soluble, altogether digestible, easily assimilable, requires no cooking, and leaves no residue. Its only fault is its perfection. It is so pure that a man cannot live on it. In fact, to make it more than a fraction of the diet is dangerous, and some people with a slight twist in their chemical routine, metabolism, should not take it at all. And here is a point where the creative chemist came in. For an American investigator, Ira Remsen, afterwards president of Johns Hopkins University, accidentally discovered a coal tar derivative, which he called saccharin, several hundred times sweeter than sugar, yet not a sugar at all. It has no nutrient value, but it flavors tea and coffee, and it is not injurious to those who cannot take sugar. 2. Chemical Conjuring We never tire of watching a conjurer who turns a crumpled handkerchief into a white rabbit, and that into a pigeon, but there is much more real conjuring in the chemical laboratory. The chemist is a transformist. With a wave of his wand he changes soft, unsaturated fats, which are apt to become rancid and smelly, into hard, saturated fats, which last and keep sweet. With another wave he transforms rank fish oil so that it can be used for soap or even for food. From beef fat the chemist originally made margarine, but other sources of fat, from coconut and cottonseed, from peanut and soya bean, may now be added to this excellent composite butter. The fact is, the animal fats are being more and more displaced by vegetable fats. But our point was simply that with a little coaxing, the chemist can change a material so that we do not know it when we see it, and that he can make excellent butter without applying to the cow. Transformations of Cellulose The cell walls of plants are made of cellulose, a carbohydrate with the same formula as starch carbon-6, hydrogen-10, oxygen-5, which often hardens into wood. We necessarily eat cellulose when we eat cabbage and the like, but we do not get much good out of it, and it is more important in other connections. It has gone to make coal, it forms wood, and it is the convenient starting point for many of the chemist's transformations. For although he may go back to inorganic elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, it is much more convenient not to have to begin at the very beginning. From wood pulp most modern paper is made, and the delicate fibers seen in paper when examined under a microscope are the remains of the cell walls of the plants. Cellulose is also used for paper cups and napkins, twine and suitcases, but it is even more important when used along with other materials, as in mercerized cotton and the artificial silk this can be made to yield. In this connection, Dr. Slosson makes good use of the story of Nobel's cut finger. Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist and a pacifist. One day, while working in the laboratory, he cut his finger, as chemists are apt to do, and again as chemists are apt to do, he dissolves some gun cotton, cellulose treated with nitric acid in the presence of sulfuric, in ether alcohol, and swabbed it on the wound. At this point, however, his conduct diverges from the ordinary. For instead of standing idle and impatiently waving his hand in the air to dry the film as most people, including chemists, are apt to do, he put his mind on it, and it occurred to him that this sticky stuff, slowly hardening into an elastic mass, 
might be just the thing he was hunting as an absorbent and solidifier of nitroglycerin, the liquid result of mixing glycerin with nitric and sulfuric acids. So, instead of throwing away the extra collodion he had made, he mixed it with nitroglycerin and found that it set to a jelly. The first of the high explosives of modern warfare. Everyone knows that this collodion is much used as new skin, which has saved many lives, and in the cameras and cinemas that have made so many people happy. And one might go on to show how the cellulose of the sawdust heap can be used to make the soles of boots, the cushions of the car, the celluloid of the toilet table, and much more besides. 3. Capturing Nitrogen All living matter consists in part of proteins, nitrogenous carbon compounds, such as white of egg, casein, gluten. It follows that a normal diet, to keep this living matter a-going, must include a supply of nitrogen. Animals cannot utilize nitrogen except in the complex form of proteins, which have been worked up by other animals or by plants. Plants get their nitrogen supplies from nitrates, like saltpeter, and similar nitrogenous salts in the soil. Therefore, it becomes of fundamental importance that the supply of nitrogenous salts in the soil should be kept up. To some extent this comes about very naturally when the withered residue of plants is, with the help of earthworms, incorporated again in the soil, or when a dead animal is buried by sexton beetles and decomposes. The same result is reached when what remains of a crop is ploughed in, or when the stable manure is spread upon the fields, and eventually takes the form of ammoniates or the like, which the plants can utilize. On the other hand, when forests or coal seams are burned by man, fixed nitrogen is lost in the combustion, and the amount of free nitrogen in the atmosphere, four-fifths of the whole, is increased. Combined nitrogen is similarly lost when gunpowder explodes, and a small cannon shot, using up only a pound of gunpowder, destroys combined nitrogen to the extent of the free nitrogen in three million liters of atmospheric air. In this sense, Professor Bunge writes, it may be affirmed that every shot from the firearm kills, that it destroys life, whether the ball strikes a living being or not. For no life is lost by the death of the individual. From the decay of the body, equivalent new life arises. But the destruction of combined nitrogen means the definite diminution of the capital, upon the amount of which the total number of living beings depends. Obviously, this is taking a very quantitative view of life. The vital equivalent of a lost leader is not calculable. We see, then, that one of the farmer's main problems is to keep up the supply of combined or fixed nitrogen in the soil. A cheap way of doing this, referred to in the chapter on botany, is to cultivate leguminous crops with root tubercles, for by means of the partner bacteria in the root swellings, such plants are able, in a way not yet understood, to capture the free nitrogen of the air and fix it. If these crops are ploughed into the soil, in whole or in part, they will make it rich for other and more valuable growths. But this is a slow process, and what the farmer does is to manure his fields, with, in particular, a supply of nitrate brought from the saltpeter fields of Chile. But Chilean nitrates are expensive, and the supply is limited. Therefore we see the enormous importance of the chemist's discovery that nitrates can be made at home. There are some Swiss valleys nowadays which are glacier at one end and 98% nitric acid at the other. The chemist has discovered how to make fertilizers, and therefore bread, out of the thin air. It has been known for a long time that a flash of lightning passing through the air may separate nitrogen atoms from one another and oxygen atoms from one another, with the results that some of the isolated nitrogen atoms unite with some of the oxygen atoms and yield nitric oxide the first step to something better. What the chemist did was to substitute for the lightning a gigantic electric arc through which the air is run rapidly, lest the terrific temperature, for example 6,300 degrees Fahrenheit, undo what has been done. When the energy for producing the electric arc can be obtained from a handy waterfall, whether natural or artificial, the relative cheapness of tapping the store of free nitrogen in the air is evident. In Germany, where water power is not so available as in Scandinavia, they hit upon another way of capturing the nitrogen of the air, the well-known Haber process. The elements used in this case are nitrogen and hydrogen, the result is ammonia, and the agent is not an electric furnace, 
but a quietly working rare metal, such as uranium, osmium, or platinum, which acts in a mysterious way as a catalyst, bringing elements that become intimate with it into union with one another. It is not to be supposed that the Haber process is a simple affair, for great pains have to be taken to get the nitrogen and the hydrogen in a very pure state before they are submitted to the catalytic action of the rare metal. Moreover, when the ammonia has been produced, it has to be changed into the more useful form of nitric acid, which involves another appeal to a catalyst, a platinum gauze, in the Ostwald process. The extent to which the air is today worked for raw materials is very wonderful, such, for example, as oxygen, which is used extensively in engineering industries with acetylene to make intensely hot flame for welding and other processes. Nitrogen, as we have seen, is obtained from the air on a great scale for the manufacture of fertilizers, the output of which is enormous. Argon and neon also are trapped from the air and are used in incandescent electric lamps. We cannot leave the subject of fertilizers without saying a little about cyanamide. When a strong electric current is passed through a mixture of lime and coke, the metal calcium joins to part of the carbon, yielding calcium carbide, composed of one calcium and two carbons. CAC2, the stuff which, along with water, produces acetylene gas. Now, if a stream of nitrogen be passed over hot calcium carbide, it is captured and forms calcium cyanamide, CACN2, a stony material sold as a fertilizer, lime nitrogen. But if the calcium cyanamide be treated with superheated steam, it yields ammonia, and from ammonia can be produced nitric acid, and from that, fertilizers, which mean more bread. It is useless to pretend, however, that this is more than one side of the story, for whether it be primitive gunpowder made by grinding up saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur into a black powder, or nitroglycerin or gun cotton, or these two combined, or TNT, all the explosives of war depend upon the readiness of the nitro group, NO2, to break up. For nitrogen does not readily combine with other elements, and when it does so, it is very prone to break off the connection on even slight provocation. The potash supply. A typical plant food is saltpeter or potassium nitrate. The nitrate part can now be snatched from the air instead of being dug from the guano beds of Chile. But what of the potash part? A ton of wheat, Dr. Schlossen says, takes away from the soil about 47 pounds of nitrogen, 18 pounds of phosphoric acid, and 12 pounds of potash. If the farmer is to go on, he must replace not only the nitrogen, but the phosphorus and the potash. The world consumption of potash for agricultural purposes is enormous. Now the great natural source of potash is at Stossfurt in Germany, a vast bed where the evaporation of seawater floods left in bygone millennia crystalline deposits of the salts which had been dissolved out of ancient rocks and left them well arranged. In 1913, the United States imported a million tons of Stossfurt salts for which the farmers paid over $20 million. Obviously, the potash supply has had to be looked for somewhere else, and the chemist has to lead the search. There are abundant salts of potassium in the rocks, for example the felspar of granite, but the difficulty is to get the potash out, or to get it out cheaply enough. As Dr. Slosson says in his inimitable way, a farmer with his potash locked up in silicates is like the merchant who has left the key of his safe at home in his other trousers. He may be solvent, but he cannot meet a slight draft. It is only solvent potash that passes current. Use is now made of the potash in wood ashes, the potash in the waste liquor of beet molasses, the potash in seaweeds, and so on, but the potash problem remains unsolved outside Germany. Wealth out of waste in many cases, as we have seen, the chemist made a new thing, such as chloroform. In many cases he made an old natural product in a new artificial way, as in the case of indigo. But in other cases his ingenuity has taken the form of discovering a use for what was previously regarded as worthless. Let us take a few examples. For many a year no one thought of utilizing the cotton seed that used to be thrown away or burned when the precious fiber was collected. Nowadays it is used in half a hundred ways, yielding cotton meal for cattle and oil for table use, writing paper and putty, fertilizers and soap, varnishes and smokeless powder. Even from such an apparently trivial source as the seeds of the tomato fruit, formerly discarded in the canning factory, 
there can be extracted over 20% of an edible oil. The chemist has led the world to a new economy. Summary The story of the chemist's achievements as a creator is one of the most brilliant chapters in the history of science, and not without its romance. We strongly recommend Dr. Edwin Slauson's Creative Chemistry from 1921, a book that reads like a novel, to which we have been greatly indebted in writing this short article. We have not been able to give more than samples of what has been accomplished. What was procurable in small quantities and at great expense as a natural product can now be made artificially and cheaply. What was once procurable but has become unavailable by reason of exhaustion or political changes can be made from simple materials and independently of any particular locality. Hundreds of entirely new things, which the world never saw before, have been synthesized. Vast quantities of material, previously unused or thrown away as waste, have been utilized as the foundation of new wealth. So the story runs, and there is no telling what chapters are to follow. It is by no means fantastic to suggest that some new biochemical discovery may alter the whole bread-and-butter problem of mankind. For a long time the chemical investigator was concerned with analysis, but to this he has added synthesis, and in so doing he has already made the world new, both for evil and for good. End of chapter 22 End of section 14